want to welcome our satellites. I like to say all around the world because it makes me feel important and valuable. Um, <laughs> but truly, welcome Colorado. We're glad you're here. Glendora and all the rest. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, excited to be with you. If you've got your Bible, you can go and put your finger in Genesis 32. That's where we're going to be. If you've got it on your phone, you can kind of call that up. But want to set this up. We, I, I hope you did your homework. I, uh, come on now. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Hard to meet with God without opening the scriptures. Um, so hope you dove in because we're talking about Jacob wrestling with God. And here's why this, well, this, it's important for all kinds of reasons in all of redemptive history. It's important. But this encounter is so important to us because we are wrestlers, right? It's hard to do this life without finding ourselves wrestling against something. We wrestle uh, in our relationships, right? Maybe you're wrestling with a spouse. Maybe you're wrestling with uh, your kids. They might be two-year-olds and they might be 42-year-olds, but maybe you're wrestling with them. Maybe there's a wrestling with friends or bosses, co-workers, right? Employees, clients. We wrestle with health. I'm, I'm always just stunned at how many people amongst even our community who live in chronic pain. That's a legitimate wrestling, right? And maybe it's not your health, but it's maybe the health of a child, the health of a friend, the health of an aging parent. We wrestle with our security. Do we have enough money? Will we have enough money? Are we safe? Are those that we love safe? Are those that we love have enough money? Can they do, do the things that we thought they should be able to do? And, and all those things. What about security? We wrestle with success, right? Am I successful? Am I in the right job or am I on the right path with staying home as a mom, the right thing? All the stuff that we're wrestling, could I do more? Should I do less? Um, will I be recognized? Do I matter, right? And we talk about this almost every week in Bible study, I think, but we have to because it's so right here with us on a daily, best, daily basis. We wrestle with our identity, right? Who am I? Really, who am I? What was I made for? What am I about? Do I matter? And then, of course, we wrestle with God. And some of us, and I hope everyone in this room at some point in your life, whether it was in your past or it's tomorrow, we all have to wrestle with that question, is God real? I mean, is he really real? Is he, not, is he more than just a rabbit's foot, my religion of choice, my good luck charm? But is he real? And if he is real, is he good? And if he's good, is he good to me, right? Is he really worthy of my life? And if he is real, in all these things that I'm wrestling with, why isn't he showing up? Why did he let this happen? Why didn't he make that happen? Why does he allow evil, difficult circumstances, difficult people, <laughs> right? Why do the wicked prosper? The psalmist asked that multiple times. Actually, Psalm 72, which is a whole nother talk, but I love the honesty of that psalm where the psalmist is like, why do the wicked prosper? I'm being faithful. I'm doing my thing, right? We wrestle with ourselves. We wrestle with those places that we so long to be different. We wrestle with the dark places in us. We wrestle with maybe something in our past that we just can't seem to get past. <laughs> we wrestle with things in our today, longing to be less of one thing and more of another thing, right? We're wrestlers. And Jacob was a wrestler. And so we see ourselves probably, I, I wonder if, if, if any other uh, person in biblical history we can relate to as much as Jacob. And he's also the most jacked up and disturbing, right? <laughs> 
He spent his whole life wrestling. He came out of the womb, I love it, he came out of the womb holding his twin brother's heel, maybe wrestling from the very beginning for a position, trying to yank him back so he could be the first, right? His name means, uh, probably literally translated heel grabber, but Hebrew uses it for uh, also the language of he cheats, <laughs> or wrestler, or he fights. And some of us, we spend our whole life fighting, fighting. And here's Jacob. He wrestled with his father who favored his older brother, right? He wrestled with that older brother, Esau, the favored son. He connived with him, right? He, bought, he, 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 sold, he, he sold his birthright to Jacob, right, just because for a soup or something stupid like that. And they had this relationship that was just a constant, like, and Jacob is the constant manipulator, constant trickster, right? Constantly wrestling with to get that birthright, which we talked about was actually already his. And then, of course, when you wrestle with someone long enough, poor Esau, he's done. He wants to kill him. And so he leaves... <laughs> And what he leaves, his, his mommy sends him off to protect him, and he leaves so he won't get killed by Esau, and then what does he enter into? More wrestling. And he wrestles with another wrestler. And so he's got his future father-in-law, Laban, who's a, who tricks the trickster, right? And tricks Jacob into marrying Leah, and he didn't want Leah. He wanted Rachel. And then he's just so stupid in his, like, because he's so stupid in love, he's so obsessed with Rachel, he doesn't even negotiate well, you know, like, he's, I'll, I'll, I'll go another seven years or whatever, what, you know, he could have said, like, a month, you know, but he didn't even offer, like, he didn't even work his way up, he's just, he's just dying, so then you've got, then you've got Leah and Rachel, he's got two wives, who now they're wrestling with each other, they're wrestling over who gets to sleep with Jacob. They're wrestling with over who's got kids, who doesn't have kids, who's all their whole value thing. And then he's wrestling again with Laban, you know, to get free from the whole thing and all that kind of stuff. You just see this guy, Jacob. He just wants to be valuable. He so desperately wants to be blessed. And to him, to get the blessing, he's got to wrestle for it. He's got to fight for it. He's got to trick somebody into it. He's wrestling with that identity, his value, his worth. And I'm Jacob. And you're Jacob, right? And I'll tell you this. How we respond to the adversity to the undesired circumstances, to the injustice. And there is injustice in Jacob's life. There's injustice in your life. How we respond to the lack of blessing. And I would imagine everyone in this room has deserved, if you will, a blessing that you didn't get from someone who mattered in your life, right? And how we respond to that is a clue to who we think we are and what we fear. Who we think we are and what we fear. You see, who we think we are, that identity piece, and what we fear marks how we live. We are driven people, driven by identity, right or wrong, driven by fear so often. So here's Jacob, right? He fears weakness. Esau's the stronger brother. Jacob's the known weaker wussy one, right? He fears the disapproval of his father. Esau is absolutely the favored son. And so how does Jacob respond? See? Well, how do we respond with our weakness, with our fear of disapproval? Well, Jacob responded in ways I think we respond. He started lying. He started cheating. He became repeatedly manipulative, and it was a clue. 
It was showing. He was probably so unaware, but everybody around him could see his fear. You see, when people fear weakness, they often resort to false pathways of strength. They want to feel strong, and so they resort to bullying, lying, cheating, covering up, powering up, manipulation, passive aggressiveness, all those things. And you know what one of the things that when people, um, when they fear weakness, have you ever noticed? (laughs) Then they just start acquiring stuff. Maybe my stuff will make me feel stronger. Maybe my stuff will cover up what is weak, right? A lot of times when I am in kind of a a place of feeling weak, I want to go shopping, (laughs) right? When people are unsure of their parents' love, and this, of course, is a warning, the story isn't about parenting, but it's got some great stuff in there about parenting, right? When people are unsure of a parent's love, especially whichever parent is withholding, it's not just about a father wound, it could be a mother wound, and this one in particular, it's a father wound. But whichever parent is withholding is the parent the child so desperately wants affirmation from, right? And you know what happens when a parent withholds? Oftentimes, and we see it for Jacob, we then obsess to find love in all kinds of other places, right? And you see this in the life of Jacob. He is obsessed with Rachel. Just obsessed. But of course, because here's a guy who who lacked love from one of his parents. And And here's the thing. See, um, Jacob's mom is thinking she's compensating for the lack of the love of the father, right? You guys, it doesn't matter. You don't get to make up for the love of the, spa- of, of the parent that's not giving it. She's thinking, I got it covered. I'll, I'll now, I'll, I'll over love Jacob. You know, I don't know if you can over love, but you know, I, I'll make him my favorite. We'll have like a competition of parents who loves which kid best, right? She thinks she's overcompen- you know, that she can overcompensate and somehow fill the gap for what that other parent hasn't given. And it doesn't work that way. I mean, it's nice that she loved him, and that's good, but he's still got a wound. And so he is going to go find love, and he is convinced it is going to be Rachel. She will fill that gap. She will fill that lonely place. She will fill all that he has wanted, all that he has needed from his dad. And so she will, and so then he's just, like I said, just stupid in his bargaining, right? You see, when we're unsure of our identity, when we're not rooted and grounded in the love of Christ for us, that we were made by Him and for Him, when, that, when we are not rooted, when I'm not living in that, then I think what Jacob did, and I know what I do, is I resort to self-sufficiency. It's all up to me. And that's what Jacob believed. He lived the lie that it was all up to him. If he was going to be blessed, he better figure out how to get it, right? And his mom kind of helped him and modeled some of that for that. But if I'm going to get the wife that I want, I better figure out how to, you know, I'll I'll work really hard. I'll, I'll work seven years. I'll do the thing to get the one that I want. It's all up to me. But the beautiful thing in Jacob's life and in ours is that along the way, he has these encounters with God. God meets him. And I love this, and it's a great principle. It's, it's something to note that for most of us, it takes multiple encounters with God. It takes multiple encounters with God. I think sometimes what we want is that one encounter. You know, I went on that one retreat. I had that one experience. I came to that one worship thing. I had this one experience, and now it's all over. Now it's awesome. Now I'm me and God. We're, no, we, got, we need another retreat. We need another, another worship. We need another gathering with community. We need another time on our front porch with the Bible in front of us. And that's what we see in the life of Jacob. And I don't have time to read all of this, but I wish I did because it's all so rich and good. But 
I want to just walk through some of his encounters to set up this uh, ultimate encounter here in chapter 32. But we see really Jacob's real first encounter with God is in Genesis 28. And remember, he has this dream and, and, and of this ladder, now really better translated stairway, stairway to heaven, you got it, um, uh, that this ladder coming down and, and the angels of the Lord are coming up and down the ladder. And this really is profound because at this time in history all around where Jacob lived, there would be what were called ziggurats. I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but I like to say it. Um, and they were uh, like kind of like little pyramids that were stairways that the priests and people would go up to meet with God. But what's profound about Jacob's vision is that in his vision, this stairway wasn't a place where he was going up, but where God was coming down. It's the gospel summed up in one passage of scripture. It's what makes Christianity unique from all other religions. Because in most all other religions, man and woman, they are reaching up to get to God. They are going through certain practices to get to God, to get to nirvana, to get to this place. But the God of Abraham and Isaac, the God of Jacob, is a God who comes down. And we know him now to have a name, Jesus, right? He comes down, he puts on flesh. But anyway, so here in this particular encounter, what we see with Jacob is that he does bust out in prayer, but his prayer is an interesting prayer. His prayer is like a lot of our prayers. His prayer here is a prayer of bargaining, right? In this prayer, he says... God, if you do this, then I will do this. You ever do that? No one here has ever done that. God, if you blank, I will this forever. If you do blank, I will stop this forever. Oh, God, if you just show up, right? And that's, that's that's where Jacob is. So he has this encounter. Then he has another encounter with God in Genesis 31, prior to this 32 passage, where God speaks to him. And tells him to return to the land of his family. And God promises to be with him. And I think there's things that are starting to sink in to Jacob when we then get to chapter 32. And what we see is this pathway of transformation. And I want to suggest to you that the pathway of transformation for Jacob is the similar pathway of transformation for us. There is three things. There is an encounter with God repeatedly. There are repeated encounters with God. There is a prayer. There is an offering up of our own. We begin to enter into dialogue with God. And there is a wound. So I want to talk a little bit about the prayer that we see in Genesis 32. I can't read it because we don't have time. But then I want to spend most of our time on the wound, right? So... This prayer in chapter 32, verses 9 through 12, this is a different prayer. Remember, before this, Jacob's prayers are like, if you, then I will, God, because he's, he, he, it's all up to him, right? When you believe that it's all up to you, your prayers are if-then prayers. If it's all up to you, then you're bargaining. Then you're, you're, you're finding out what you need to do, the other piece, person needs to do, and then you'll do this, Right? It's an if-then prayer. But when you get to chapter 32, the prayer changes. And Jacob has had this, these couple of encounters with God. And now we see uh, Jacob praying a prayer that's marked by humility. Marked by adoration. Marked by an uh, evident deep, deepening understanding of who God is and who Jacob is. And so he says to God. He calls God in this prayer the God of Abraham and Isaac. And of course, in a very polytheistic society, he's naming, my God isn't just any God. You're the God. You're God. And then he acknowledges that God is a God who speaks. You're a God who speaks to me. You're not a distant God. You're a God who's come near, and you've spoken to me, and you've told me to return to my people. And you said you'd do good to me and that you'd keep your covenant for me. And he acknowledged, this is the kind of God you are. And he's just adoring God and he's telling God who he is. And then we see Jacob with a different understanding of himself. 
And in this prayer, he's not bargaining, he's repenting. In this prayer, he's not bargaining. He's not bowing up with self-sufficiency. He's bowing down in humility. And he says to God in this prayer, I'm not worthy. You're a God of love and faithfulness, and I'm not worthy of your love and faithfulness. But I'll take it. I'll take it. And then his prayer is not no longer this prayer of self-sufficiency, but a prayer of deep, deep need. You see Jacob crying out in this prayer, deliver me, protect me from Esau. And even that humble admission, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I don't know what's going to happen. God, would you protect me? God, would you deliver me? And you see this from a bargaining prayer to just a just a humble, adoring, weak, and needy prayer. And then he has this encounter that starts in verse 32, the wound. So it says this, says that same night, of course, Jacob's getting his, all his stuff and his family ready to face Esau, right? And he's getting strategic about it and all those kind of things. And it says in verse 22, this same night, Jacob arose and he took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 children. And he crossed the ford of that Jabbok, whatever that is. He took them and he sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And then verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. Do you want to change? Do you want transformation? Any place that we want change begins with us. I can be so focused on everyone else in my world that needs to change. But if I want change, it begins with me, right? And I, su- I will suggest this. I, you know, we talk about, and I believe in community. I think it's important to work things out in community. But for anyone who wants to have Christ, God-initiated change in our life, there, is a, there, is, there are moments when we must be alone with God. There is a moment when it does come down to, I just got to be with him. And so you see Jacob, he's left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And of course, if you did your homework, you know in the context of this passage, and we'll see it unfold as we read it, but this isn't just any man, right? This is God himself coming to wrestle with Jacob, to wrestle with the wrestler, right? To meet him where he is, to meet him in this uh, broken place, Verse 25, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob. Now, this is God. He could prevail against Jacob. But it likens to Philippians chapter 2, where it says of Jesus that even though he was God, he did not regard equality with God, something to be grasped, but he lowered himself, he humbled himself and took on humanity. He became a man and he walked among us and he became obedient to the ways of the Father and he self-restricted himself. It's the same thing that happened when Jesus hung on a cross, right? Could he have come off the cross? Could he have wiped everybody out? Absolutely. They're saying, well, if he's really God, prove yourself. Call down angels. Could he have called down angels? Of course. Of course he could call down angels. But if he called down angels, he wouldn't have accomplished our salvation. He wouldn't have accomplished what he went to the cross for. And in this moment, God, I believe, self-restricts himself to accomplish a greater thing for what he wanted to do in the life of Jacob, right? And so it says that when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. You see, God could have annihilated Jacob. But instead, he chose to merely wound him. And it's not a small thing that he did wound him. I know very few, well, every, 
older person I know who walks and loves Jesus in a way that I want to be with them and glean from them and learn from them and be like them. They're all men and women who have been wounded. Now, whether it's God authored the wound or God allowed the wound, however we want to look at it, there are times when the wound is the most gracious thing that could ever happen to us. Because if our aim is power and self-sufficiency, then a wound is really not what we're looking for. But if our aim is intimacy with God, if our aim is humility, if our aim is to be like the wounded servant that is Jesus, then we will accept. We don't go looking for wounds, but we will thank him for the wound. So God, this man, touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for the day has broken. And this, I love this. Because what is Jacob doing here? Instead of fleeing, he is clinging. God has wounded him. And instead of running from him, he holds tighter to him. Something has changed in Jacob. The man says, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not go unless you bless me. And here's Jacob, all his life, who's been longing for a blessing. All his life. Who the, who the last blessing he got, which he didn't even have to do, and he, he, he resorted to trickery. And now I think he's realizing he's having a real, I think he's realizing who he's wrestling with. And I think he's recognizing that on, the only one who can truly bless him his father's blessing is going to be a blessing, but it's going to be a limited blessing. It's going to be a blessing from one who is broken. And now he's, he's holding on to the one who can actually give an ultimate blessing, an eternal blessing, a blessing that will not be broken, a perfect blessing. And so Jacob, I love this, rather than fleeing, rather than fighting, he clings. He says, I'm not going to let go of you unless you bless me. I love that he doesn't say, why'd you hurt my hip? Why'd you give me a limp? See, that's where we get, a lot of us get stuck in the wound. And we miss the blessing. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be wrestler. Your no, name shall no longer be fighter. Your name shall no longer be cheater. You're not going to fight anymore, Jacob, he's basically saying. Your name shall no longer be fighter, but your name will be Israel, which means God fights. Right? Because no longer are you going to need to fight because I'm going to fight for you. Your identity is no longer, it's all about me, it's all up to me. Your identity, your very name, which in this culture, that was your identity. Your name said who you were. He says, your name now says, God fights. I can rest. God fights for me, right? Then Jacob asked, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask me my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of this place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. And I have to believe that Jacob, in some strange way, loved that limp. Because that limp reminded him of the moment when he had this face-to-face -face encounter with God. And instead of running like he used to do in the past, instead of fighting like he used to do in the past, he clung. He held on. 
And so for a minute, and I know we're running a little later, but I want to I wanna get practical with this. What do we do with our wrestling selves, okay? What do we do when we're wrestling? And you're saying, well, I don't wrestle. I don't even know about wrestling. I'm not a wrestler. Here's how we know where we wrestle. Where are you anxious? What is the thing that keeps you up at night? Why are you flipping around in your bed at two in the morning? What's the thing that you obsess over? What's the thing you can't let go of? What's the thing that you just keep getting ramped up on? Okay, that's your thing. Well, here's what we do with those things. And the Lord has been taking me on this journey. And so I was, as I was preparing, I was looking back through my journal. And I thought, you know, maybe this would be helpful for you. So three things we do. What do we do when we're wrestling? First, we pause. We slow down. We get alone with God, right? We reflect we don't react. Second, we name it. What is the anxiety? What's the thing that we're anxious about? And we begin to look at that, and we circle the words, and we look at the themes. And then we, third, we replace the anxiety or the fear or whatever it is with grace and truth. So here's some examples from my life, um, and uh, here's my journal. So was looking back. So there was a point where I was anxious about a decision I had to make. And so I was journaling, and I'm a journaler. Um, if you're not a journaler, I don't know how to do it otherwise. So um, <laughs> I'm just writing it down. I'm just pouring it out on the pages. What about this decision, and how am I feeling at? Why am I so anxious about it? Why is it keeping me up at night? Why am I obsessing over it? So I wrote it all down, and what I began to see were some repeating words. And this one was super clear, because over and over, this is what I was writing down. I'm afraid I'll make the wrong choice. I fear others will pre pressure me to make a choice I don't want to make. Um, I fear I'm missing the right choice because it's something I haven't thought of and I can't see. And so I began to see this theme, right? Fear, 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 fear. So I circled that. And then I asked the Lord, and don't rush to this, um, but I sat with the Lord and I said, Lord, what do I replace this fear with? Now, I preach, so I like alliteration, so maybe the Lord speaks to me in alliteration. He knows it's my love language. I don't know that this is what you always replace fear with, but in that moment, I did really feel like he said, oh, faith, I want you to replace this fear with faith. And then I, I, I get, went kind of on a, a journey, actually, for multiple days of exploring this idea of faith. And where does it show up in the scripture? And what does it mean that God is the object of my faith, right? I didn't have any guarantee of the outcome, but in the process, I had a guarantee that God was with me and that my faith was in, in, in him and I wasn't going to live in this fear. Another example, um, I, was ex I was anxious about a circumstance that I wanted to be different. Similar kind of thing. Um, I was asking, why is this making me so anxious? Again, I just began to pour it out in the journal. Um, and I'll have to say this, so I, I'm describing the reasons for my anxiety about this. And I, was, I felt pretty justified in all of my feelings, right? <laughs> and here's the repeating words. They're not pretty. Um, so here's the repeating words in my journal. Mad, angry. So I put those two together. Mad and angry. <laughs> Frustrated. Hurt slash wounded. Okay, put those together. Um, afraid of being stuck, okay? So then I put in my journal, anger, frustrated, hurt, slash wounded, stuck. And then I just sat and I said, Lord, what do you want me to replace these with? And again, uh, I, I think God could have said different words to different people on these things. But for me, I felt like he was saying, with anger, replace it with compassion. And so I wrote that down. And I began to think of the people involved in the situation. And I began to say, Lord, give me compassion. Show me that, and I think God showed me that everyone involved in this, they all had good intentions. They were doing their best. They had their own stuff, right? And hopefully that didn't lead to self-righteousness. But, but compassion, right? Frustrated. Felt like the Lord took me to patient slash calm is what I had written down. Invited me to slow down. Invited me to respond, not react. Asked me, this is what I wrote this in my uh, This is what I wrote. You don't have to speak. And then I wrote this under it in my journal. Every feeling is not an invitation to discourse. <laughs> I just, that was mind-boggling to me. Really. 
<laughs> Lord, I have a feeling it must be spoken. <laughs> I have a feeling I must work that out. And then uh, <laughs> every feeling is not an invitation to discourse. Uh, let it go, right? And then the hurt slash wounded. God, what do, I, what do I do with that? And I felt like he was taking me to forgiveness. And I sat and thinking of the different people involved and, and thinking, what does it look like for me to forgive? What does it look like for me to uh, forgive like Jesus who said, forgive them, they, they know not what they do, right? A, a forgiveness that comes from compassion, a forgiveness that, that isn't a powering up, but a willingness to even absorb, because that's what forgiveness does. There's a cost to the one who forgives, always. And then stuck, and then that's the Lord just took me to, um, you're not stuck, you have choice. You're a volitional being. You, you, have cho- you can choose uh, wisdom over foolishness. You can uh, choose uh, to, is the stuck, what I wrote, is the stuckness truly a burden? Oh, this was one. Is the stuckness truly a burden or is it actually a freedom? And in my journal I wrote, sometimes limitations free us for more, right? But I wouldn't have gotten to any of those places without getting alone, creating space, and asking the question, because my anxiety is the clue to my wrestling. And then one last thing, I love this, I love this, I love this. Um, The first time that God is ever referred to as shepherd in the Bible is by Jacob in Genesis uh, chapter 48, when he's near his death and he's blessing all of his children. He says this, he says to, over Joseph, he says, he's blessing him and he says, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. That Jacob could look back at all his conniving, all his tricking, all his wrestling, all his fighting, and see that God had been there as his shepherd, right? The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23 I shall not wrestle, right? I shall not want, but maybe it would be. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not wrestle. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me go to the calm place. He makes me make a space, right? He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though that's still my circumstance, even though it hasn't changed, right? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table, a banquet is the idea. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. That's a language of blessing, You bless me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord um, forever and ever. The Lord is my shepherd. He is my good shepherd. Even when I've been wrestling, even when I've been fighting, even when I've been manipulating, even when I've been looking for the blessing from everybody else but God himself, he has been my shepherd. I will not wrestle. God, would that be true of us? Take the fight out of us, Lord, that we might let you fight for us. Oh, thank you that you invite us to spaces with you to sit, to listen, to let you speak into us. Oh, we need more of that, Lord. We need more of that quiet. We need more of that reflection. We need more of that time with you. God, I pray for myself. I pray for these friends. Would we find those spaces even today? And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.